This short film is about The Boy with the Top Knot, which is a book I wrote two or three years ago. And I'm basically doing in the film what I did in the book, in that I'm going back to my past in 1980s Wolverhampton, and I'm trying to integrate the two elements of my life, my working life in London and my family life in Wolverhampton. Throughout my 20s, I deliberately set up this barrier between my home life and my London life and had this semi-successful career in London as a media a columnist and so on. I also had a very traditional Sikh family. The way I dealt with it is I never let the two mix at all. And I think that extended to not even thinking about my past. Because whenever I did think about my past, I found it, it's a bit like having vertigo. Because it was so different from the world I was living in and enjoying. I felt sick and I just couldn't make sense of it. I had to write the book for my own self, I think. The book has made all of us uh, appreciate each other much more. It's made what we've been through, our story and our relationships, much more transparent. I grew up in a very um, inner city area, Wolverhampton. But we moved to uh, a suburb when I was about 11. I couldn't speak English until I was, I think, about five or six. The first day I went to school, didn't know a word, didn't understand a word the teachers were saying. It's interesting how I've gone from not being able to speak English to it being my life and being a writer, and now actually struggling quite a lot with Punjabi, because all, all the Punjabi I have is from my mother and my father, basically. But increasingly, I find that I've got a limited vocabulary, and my, my cousins and my siblings often laugh at the way I speak Punjabi. Um, I find it quite frustrating sometimes, you know. And I think my mum just thinks I'm a bit dim because my vocabulary is so limited. Yeah. You feel different if you speak a different language. And I think quite a lot of a few um, bilingual people say that. You just feel like a different person. I come from such a large Sikh family and I've got 54 first cousins and pretty much all of them had gone along with convention and had an arranged marriage and I, I spent about 10 years going along with emotions and having these endless arranged marriage meetings but at the same time I had this secret life away from my family where I was having illicit relationships with non-seek girls. ਅਸੀਂ ਆਪਣੇ ਜੱਟ ਸਿੱਖ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਹੀ ਵਿਆਹ ਕਰਨਾ ਚਾਹੁੰਦੇ ਸੀ ਰਿਲੀਜਨ ਵੀ ਜੱਟ ਸਿੱਖ ਹੋ ਗਏ ਬਹੁਤ ਸਟਿਕ ਰਹੀ ਮੈਂ ਇਹਦੇ ਤੇ ਤੇ ਯੂਨੀਵਰਸਿਟੀ ਵੀ ਜਾਂਦਾ ਸੀ ਇਸ ਨਾਮ ਨਹੀਂ ਮੈਂ ਪੜਨਾ ਹੀ ਆ ਵਿਆਹ ਆਪਣੇ ਰਿਲੀਜਨ ਚ ਹੋਵੇ ਬਾਅਦ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਵੀ ਇਹਨੇ ਮੈਨੂੰ ਰਿਸਪੈਕਟ ਕੀਤੀ ਮੈਨੂੰ ਨਹੀਂ ਕੁਝ ਪ੍ਰੋਬਲਮ ਪੈਣ ਦਿੱਤਾ ਮੇਰੇ ਤੇ ਪ੍ਰੈਸ਼ਰ ਨਹੀਂ ਪਾਇਆ ਪਰ ਫੇਰ ਜਦ ਮੈਨੂੰ ਚਿੱਠੀ ਦਿੱਤੀ ਆ ਚਿੱਠੀ ਮੈਂ ਪੜ੍ਹੀ ਆ ਪੜ ਕੇ ਫੇਰ ਮੈਂ ਉਹ ਚਿੱਠੀ ਨੂੰ ਫੀਲ ਕੀਤਾ ਬਈ ਮੈਂ ਆਪ ਦੇ ਮੁੰਡੇ ਤੇ ਬਹੁਤ ਸਟਿਕ ਵਾ ਮੈਂ ਨਹੀਂ ਹੋਣਾ ਚਾਹੀਦਾ ਇਹਦੀ ਵੀ ਲੈਪ ਵਾ ਇਹਨੇ ਕੋਈ ਗਲਤ ਕੰਮ ਨਹੀਂ ਕੀਤਾ ਲੈਪ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਹਰ ਇੱਕ ਗੱਲ ਮੈਨੂੰ ਪੁੱਛ ਕੇ ਕਰਦਾ ਰਿਹਾ ਮੈਨੂੰ ਦੱਸਦਾ ਰਿਹਾ ਤੇ ਫੇ ਮੈਂ ਐਂਡ ਤੇ ਕਹਤਾ ਵੀ ਤੂੰ ਹੁਣ ਤੇਰੀ ਮਰਜ਼ੀ ਆ ਜਿੱਦਾਂ ਤੇਰਾ ਜੀ ਕਰਦਾ ਕਰ ਲੈ ਵੀ ਅਸੀਂ ਹੈਪੀ ਆ ਹੁਣ ਜੋ ਵੀ ਤੂੰ ਜਿੱਥੇ ਵੀ ਤੂੰ ਵਿਆਹ ਕਰਾਉਣਾ ਚਾਹੇਗਾ ਤੇ ਅਸੀਂ ਹੈਪੀ ਆ ਕਰ ਲੈ ਆਈ the one thing she'd say is if you knew what I'd been through you wouldn't do this which is the kind of uh, universal cry of emotionally blackmailing mums across the world so i thought you know what i'll find out exactly what you went through i'll write a book about your life aur eto sanu koi mand nahi hai ga saadi assi kehda koi bhi chori kiti ja koi jhoot bolya sachi lap wa sachi lap da mere munde ne khud aap likhi ya oh bhi strong ho ke unne likhi maa pe da dukh likhya strong ho ke likhi ya ਹਾਰਡ ਵਾਲੀ ਖਣੀ ਮਾਂ ਪੇ ਤੇ ਦੁੱਖ ਲਈ ਅਸੀਂ ਹੈਪੀ ਆ ਸਾਡੇ ਮੁੰਡੇ ਨੇ ਇੰਨਾ ਸੋਚਿਆ ਸਾਰਾ ਕੁਝ ਆਪਣੇ ਆਪ ਲਿਖੀ ਆ ਹੈਪੀ ਆ ਦੁੱਖ ਨੂੰ ਲਕੋ ਨਾ ਕਦੇ ਵੀ ਦੁੱਖ ਨੂੰ ਕਿਸੇ ਨਾਲ ਦੱਸਾਂਗੇ ਮਨ ਅੰਦਰੋਂ ਹੌਲਾ ਹੁੰਦਾ ਦੁੱਖ ਨੂੰ ਜੇ ਲਕੋਈ ਜਾਂਦੇ ਆ ਜਿਆਦਾ ਹੋਰ ਵਧੀ ਜਾਂਦਾ 1 ਫੋਰ ਨਰ ਟੂ ਨਾਲ ਵਾ ਹੈ ਹਮ ਓ ਯਾ in families people have this incredible ability to avoid difficult subjects well, one of the things i discovered is that my sister and my father suffer from schizophrenia and um i think i was that about 25 years old when i found out and i literally found a letter in in, in a suitcase which said 
about my father which said this man suffers from paranoid schizophrenia and it struck me as a real shock. My mum went out of her way to protect me from the worst effects of their disease and whenever something very, terrible very happened she made sure <laughs> on a very basic level I wasn't around so my childhood wasn't affected by any of that stuff. I spent my childhood lost in this kind of fog of cheesy 1980s pop music and had a really happy time and I wanted the book to be a kind of tribute to my mum for enabling me to have that quite remarkable childhood in this quite bleak context of severe mental illness. So this is the old front room we used to have, which is so posh we couldn't actually sit in there. You know, you used to have the corner <laughs> sofa, <laughs> untouched. Yeah, like my mum's room there. Blimey, this is crazy. I haven't been in 25 years. Seriously? Yeah, so my mum used to have a sewing machine there, and TV was up there, and we used to sit here. So this is my bedroom, which I weirdly shared with my parents until I was about 10, I think. It's pretty cramped. We had two two uh, double beds next to each other. And then for a birthday present, I bought an Argos desk and had it there. And I had a, a map of the world next to a, a poster of Prince. And mum used to complain that um, he looked like a ghost. No, he looked like a witch. And she wanted to take him down. I remember this cupboard, so I used to put our food in here. Wagon wheels, lots of wagon wheels. I used to go up and down this alleyway on my bike about 20 times a day. And um, all these gardens were like really highly cultivated kind of mini Indian farms, you know, with like, you know, spinach and, and all these amazing vegetables. But now look at it, it's um, basically weeds. Is this our shed? Yeah, this used to be our shed. Where we used to have our, our kittens and our cats used to hang out there. Look, it looks so different though. It's sad, isn't it? I don't know whether it's whether it's because I don't remember. I've idealised my childhood, or whether it has actually got rougher. It's got rougher. It's got rougher. Without yeah. a doubt, back in them days, it was a bit easier. But you had the racist thing going on a bit. Do you know what I mean? But yeah. other from that, you know, it's just totally changed in the last five six years. Yeah. It's a shame because like it has so many happy childhood memories for me. Yeah. yeah. And that was a street yeah. shop, and now it's a, like a nice. crack den. Yeah. Now there's different types of <laughs> Again, I think the structure of the book kind of, again, just happened. It feels like my mum wrote a lot of it and created the book in that she told me her story and the way she told me her story shaped the book. It alternates between uh, the present and also my parents' past, my past and my present. It also alternates between London and the Midlands. And that's a dichotomy I've always had in my life. But now I think they're much more intermingled and that was the whole point of the exercise, really. I wanted to have a much more connected life. I think I need both things in my life to stay, stay sane. I, always, I, I go for about three or four weeks in London before I need to go back to the Midlands. And equally, I can only manage a week in the Midlands before I begin to go it's slightly insane, I need to come back. I think if I didn't have that to escape from and to, I'd be a very different person. But I think that defines me, the, the two different things.